Coming up on Techzilla, Minecraft. Who's behind the hottest game on the internet? Veronica got the latest ebooks. Well, one's awesome and one made Veronica very angry. Kyle from Hard OCP is here with the latest in water cooling in a box. Do they still suck? Hackathon, Google turns 12 and refurbished hard drives. And of course, a stack of your viewer questions. So boil up some macaroni and shake the powder out of the pouch because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by the United States Air Force, Squarespace, and Jack Threads. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Captain Jean-Luc Picard. <gasps> You're not Jean-Luc. Make it so. <laughs> Speed. Look, I'm not the palest person on the show today. <laughs> <laughs> not that makes by me much. feel good about myself. Well, then, all, you know what? We're going to get you a fake tan, get you all orange and glowy. No. 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 No Verona fake tan. No, but thank you for Mighty's for giving me this awesome shirt. This like shiny my new shirt. favorite t shirt. Yeah. You've actually been wearing that all day with a big grin on your face. I know, because it's hilarious. <laughs> well, the other part is there's just awkward <laughs> moments in the office where you're like, look here, and we're like, <laughs> well, Only go Texella. where no Jean-Luc Picard has been before. <laughs> and on reviews, the latest tech right and t-shirts and how to make the most out of the gear you already got. Yes, whether you're a beginner <laughs> or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or the best beef jerky this side of Sierra Nevadas, we've got an answer for you. And if we don't, we're going to track down someone who does and take their beef jerky. Yes, well, yes. we have an email from the Texilla crew safety monitors. <gasps> Tom writes in, I hear you often recommend rubbing alcohol for various cleaning applications. My experience is that rubbing alcohol sometimes has oil as one of its components. Mm -hmm. This will remain on the surface and will attract dirt. I recommend buying isopropyl alcohol, which can usually be found at a drugstore. Tom. Damn skippy, Tom. If I said rubbing alcohol, I must have been well, spent too much time that day using mm -hmm. the oh so cheap wonder cleaner. It unsticks soda soaked keyboards, it cleans old thermal compound off of CPUs, it even dissolves peanut butter off of HDTV screens. Isopropyl alcohol, just thin it out first, especially for the HDTV screens. <clears throat> Apparently, my inner snuggy huckster is kind of wanting to come out and play today, but <laughs> isopropyl alcohol. Try to get like 90% or better from your drugstore. It's cheap. It's a yes. great way to clean electronics because it disappears into the ether and leaves nothing behind unless you get the wintergreen version or the rubbing alcohol version that is scented, in which There's case... There's a wintergreen version? It's not something you want to put on a motherboard because then you're... PC. If it doesn't outright mm. damage your PC's motherboard, it'll just smell like wintergreen. It'll be minty fresh. Best to get one of those little plug-in ones for the Broken wall socket. Broken and minty fresh. And congrats to Google, who turned 12 this week. They're a tween now. <laughs> and they had Cake and Jem Ohm, aka the woman that crushed it at the TechCrunch Disrupt Hackathon this weekend. She coded against 450 odd developers and slugged it out amidst 86 60 second judge presentations. Yeah, Jem didn't turn 12, but she, she did, did win not the turn 12. No, yeah, although her, that would be pretty. Um, um, elite. <laughs> that would be beyond elite. Yeah. With Gems app Wise Day makes it easier for iPhone users to let your family and friends know where you are or last were. She calls it a black box for your iPhone that records your last known location. It's got to be good because not only did it win, but one of the crankiest coders I know who will just absolutely call BS on everything, well, they were singing Wise Dame's praises. So congratulations to Jeb. Girl power. That was like, I guess it was like a 48-hour coding marathon, yeah. something like that. I was seeing a lot of Twitter posts about it. So that's that's pretty awesome. <laughs> a lot of erratic Twitter posts. Yes, and we've been fielding lots and lots of questions about Android-based tablets. Uh, the classic being, did you look at any Android tablets before you bought your iPad? A good answer being no, because uh, we haven't seen many Android tablets other than Dell Streak, which is nice. It's nice. It's nice. It's, yeah. The screen's a little small. Yeah. Also on the nice list is RIM's new playbook, or as mm -hmm. Gadget calls it, the BlackBerry tablet. <laughs> Introduced at the BlackBerry Developer Conference this week, RIM says the 7-inch Cortex A9 powered playbook will deliver 1080p video, ship with full document editing and pairing with BlackBerry phones, and include HDMI and USB ports, front and rear HD cameras, and measure 9.7 millimeter thin. Not too bad. That's pretty. Sl it looked pretty awesome from the pictures I saw. It looked a lot like an iPad. It did kind of look like an iPad. And like yeah. pretty much everybody else selling any piece of hardware you can hold in your hands. Uh, RIM, the, the, the leaders at RIM said this is going to be an incredible gaming platform for mm. publishers and the players. Interesting. Very interesting. A RIM gaming platform. <laughs> Well, it's a BlackBerry gaming platform. Yes, we will We will see how that goes. Mm, yeah. I don't know. There's only so many ways you can turn a screen into a computer. And it, it looks nice. Yeah, 
I'll be curious to see I'm looking forward it. to getting our hands on it. It'll be interesting to see whether or not it, it goes consumer or sort of in the traditional BlackBerry corporate kind of arena. Yeah. I have yeah. a, um, and in, in other tablet news, I have a tablet to talk about later. Tablet-like device. Well, that's not a tablet. That's Android. an e-reader that made you angry. It's an e-reader based green, on Android. Like I don't want to talk about it yet. I'm mad. So I might just be the last person to find out about Minecraft, but apparently it's blown up over the past couple of weeks. It's the indie game that's managed to achieve incredible success in spite of its simple 3D graphics, tiny budget, and no big name publisher. Here to give us all the lowdown on what Minecraft is all about and the real story behind it is ByteJacker's Anthony Carboni. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So what what is Minecraft? I hadn't heard about it until Leo Laporte told me about it on, on Twit this week. But yeah, it's kind of been going crazy story. over the last couple of weeks. It's Ostensibly, it's just... A, a sandbox game, right? So you you get this randomly generated world, and your job is to kind of like survive by building structures and finding supplies. But it, it's it's really really in depth. Mm -hmm. Like the world that you generate is completely random. You start off with nothing in your hands, and you have to just kind of like scrape trees for wood. And from there, people just assemble their materials until they've built giant castles or subway systems or. All kinds of crazy stuff. Rocket powered mine cars. Ooh. Yeah. I saw a roller coaster one. Yeah, the roller coaster is amazing, cool. right? Yeah. So, uh, what makes it so popular, though? Is it just people like to gather materials and build stuff out of nothing? I think so. You know, there's there's such a level of depth to it, and it's so charming looking, too. Like, if you've seen it's it, it's very 8 bit. Yeah. yeah, it totally is. And it looks ridiculously simple and cartoony, which kind of draws you in. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, you're like, well, I've got to find this particular kind of stone because this, <laughs> this pickaxe isn't cutting it. I need an obsidian pickaxe or I'm not going to get anywhere. You know, and the size of the world is so huge that you could walk around for hours and not find your way back to the place you were before. So there's a lot going on and there's a lot of depth that just kind of draws, like, draws you in. So as an indie game, uh, what makes this so significant to the gaming community? Does it really mean that any indie developer can just kind of come out of nowhere and create like a hugely successful game? You know, I don't, I don't want to say like, Yes, this proves that everybody can sit at home and make a skillion dollars. I mean, Marcus, the guy who makes the game, is obviously kind of a super genius and, and kind of a little bit obsessive. But yeah, this is one guy who was sitting in his room for a year and a half Ooh, wow. and made a million dollars in a year and a half. That's kind of crazy. That's pretty awesome. I heard there's also some controversy around the game. Well, there was, there was a little bit of uh, a problem with PayPal. Mm. Um, what happened was he started making a lot of money very fast. And here's this guy who literally never even thought to incorporate. Um, when I spoke to him, he just incorporated like two weeks ago and started like hiring people and starting a business. So PayPal's looking at all these people sending you know, $13 at a time to this kid who's never leaving his room. And they're like, whoa. And so they freeze everything. <gasps> They like, and he had seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Oh my God, that's so much money! <laughs> yeah, and they totally froze. They totally froze it, and they're like, "Dude, how did you get seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars? <laughs> what are you doing?" Right, and and what people were worried about is, you know, two years ago when something awful was collecting money for Hurricane Katrina, mm -hmm. PayPal did the same thing, froze them, locked them down. But what happened was, PayPal wound up returning everybody's money. So what everybody was afraid of was that Marcus wasn't going to be able to like keep his money. Yeah. And then there would be 200,000 people who got Minecraft for free, and he'd have to start all over again. So what happened? Uh, what happened is they came to an agreement, and it, it's funny, Marcus calls it the hit by a bus clause. And what it basically is is PayPal holds 5% of his money for 90 days. So if he gets hit by a bus and people don't get Minecraft for a few weeks, mm -hmm. PayPal has the money to return to them as opposed to it automatically being in his account. Ah, well that's good. Yeah. So he's really like setting himself up for a pretty sec secure financial future at this point. What's crazy is this game's in alpha. This game doesn't have anywhere near the feature set it's going to have. And you've already got 200,000 copies sold and a million people playing the free version. Mm -hmm. And he's just now incorporating. So it's going to get crazy. This guy is going to be like ridiculously Howard Hughes rich very Plus, soon. Plus, a lot of back taxes. Yeah, I wonder how taxes. that's going. <laughs> well, the first guy he did Not hire. All your money. <laughs> the first guy he did hire was a business affairs guy to kind yeah, of handle that for him. Yeah, probably. And he's in a Scandinavian country too, so hmm. they they take like a huge chunk. So oh wow! It'll be interesting to see how much he keeps. So, any tips for playing Minecraft? Anything that you do to succeed within the game? Read the wiki. Read the wiki, otherwise you are going to run around and die. It, it literally drops you into a situation where you have nothing and you have no idea what to do. And he hasn't done a tutorial yet. Oh, jeez. <laughs> like, 
figure it out. I, I spent like three in-game day, in game days just dying in the dark. How do you die? What kills you? There are zombies at night. <gasps> oh, of course there's zombies at night. Well, of course, there are always zombies at night, Veronica. All right, so where do you go to buy this game? How much is it? It's Minecraft.net. Right now it's uh, 13 bucks while it's in alpha. The full version is going to be 25 so you definitely want to run out and grab it now. I'm definitely going to do that because do it. it seems like a big time suck and I always get attracted to games like that that you just can't put down for a really long time. Yeah. Could always use one more Perfect. time suck, right? Oh yeah, yeah. big time. <laughs> well, thank you for being on the show. Where can people find more of your stuff online? Uh, you can catch us at bitejacker.com or revision3.com slash bitejacker and we've got a Minecraft special on this week. Oh, fantastic. How See? timely. See how that worked together? Looking to cool down your CPU? Can a water cooler in a box hold its own against pricier competition? Hard OCP's Kyle Bennett has the word when we return. But while we've got your attention, a special thanks to one of the sponsors of today's episode, the United States Air Force. Sir, debris heading towards our comm satellite. Impact may cut off communications with ground forces. Launch avoidance maneuver. Twenty kilometers in closing. Collision averted, sir. All objects are accounted for. Good job. Learn more at airforce.com. Hard OCP's Kyle Bennett joins us to talk about the latest in water cooling, Corsair's Hydro Series 870 PC cooler. Kyle, welcome back to the show, man. How's it going, Patrick? I mentioned just at the beginning, like, if, if we were talking actually before I'm pretty sure, like, a few weeks ago, I get my code gauge, True Spirit, I have a quiet, like, freaking $45 air cooler that's working better than the old water cooling. And Corsair comes out with a new fully sealed water cooling kit, the H70. So the H50, I was never really impressed with. H70, is it doing better? Is, is sealed water cooling kits, are they up there? So the, the, the H50, mm -hmm. we'll go back a little bit, was uh, some Ace Tech technology. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a European company, you might remember them. They really introduced phase change cooling here in the United States mm -hmm. with the Ace Tech uh, Vapor Chill. Sure. It was the was the brand name on it. So that was really that was really just a almost a, a slight one off that Corsair spec that H fifty was. It was really somebody else's product. Okay. So the the H seventy really represents a product that Corsair is actually engineered. So the um, the H seventy comes to us and I've got one sitting here, so <laughs> I don't know how I don't know how well you can see this. It's uh, the radiator is about twice as big as it used to be. Right. We also have push-pull fans set up on it, which obviously add to the, the overall dimensions of it. And we still have a we still have our pump and our heat exchanger down here on the end, which is actually totally changed from the H50. I was gonna say the heat exchanger on the H50 just seemed kind of underwhelming. Like this is you're holding basically $110 worth of hardware. You've got a decent radiator, two fans, you know, and and the heat exchanger isn't painfully awkward uh, as no. it may have been in the past. <laughs> $103 this morning at Amazon was like street price. That's pretty I know good. Corsair was trying to shoot more towards 90 bucks on these, but so we've seen them come up a little bit. Okay. But uh, the heat exchanger on this, they did a really good job. I don't know if you can see this or not. It actually has these swivels on it. Very nice. Right there. So it makes, uh, it makes installing this unit a lot easier than the last one. Mm-hmm. Then also you don't have the height to deal with above the CPU area as well. And that's good because obviously you're probably going to have this sticking back over it. <laughs> so there's there's a method to their madness. But overall, it's a it's simply a better unit mm -hmm. than the H50. It, uh, it, can, it, it, it cools better mm -hmm. and it seems to have a, a larger wattage load that it can cool. Last time we had you on, one of the things we talked about, the reason I got the True Spirit, you were singing its praises. How's it compared, like $100 worth of water cooling gear versus $50 worth of air cooling? Are you really getting a huge advantage at, at wide open throttle now, still with the water coolers? Honestly, I mean, I, I have a hard time calling this a water cooling system. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, I, I own a water block that costs more than that entire system. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So this isn't really, you know, we did some open bench tests uh, with these last year. And in an open bench scenario, and this is one of the reasons you saw us change our testing, we actually right. did it in case, was those, uh, the high-end air coolers, like the, uh, the thermal right and the, the, the go cage you're talking about, or the co gauge, work just as well as these in an open bench. Okay. So really, you know, it comes down to, to what, what, is, what is this one delivering that, that, that your traditional $80 air cooler or $40 or $50 air cooler can't deliver? 
And that is the, the simple fact that you get to mount this radiator mm -hmm. in a position where it can intake cool air across the cooling fans. Right. Okay. And that's the one thing that air cooling, traditional air cooling, just can't simply cannot deliver. Unless you unless you have some, you know, crazy ducting system going on inside <laughs> your, on, inside your chassis. Does it sound like a jet taking off? No, you can't hear the you can't hear the big fans hardly at all. Cool. And I actually put together the first system with a 980X uh, Intel Core i7 CPU in it mm -hmm. and passively cooled it wow. and overclocked it to 3.8. That's pretty good. So the, the trick here is, and, and this, is, this is the trick, right? When you're looking at something like this Corsair, this will allow you to get a lot of cooling uh, via, via ambient temperature air mm -hmm. to your CPU quite easily. Okay. Right? If you feel like jumping through some hoops and actually ventilating your case properly, Mm -hmm. and actually doing it right or you know that kind of thing and making sure you have proper airflow mm -hmm. which which is not always easy right right if you can if you can get proper airflow there's there's no doubt in my mind that you can get just as good a cooling with air cooling inside the case as you can with one of these okay but but the H70 and the H50 make it make it really easy to do so the bottom line, like most aftermarket coolers, quality aftermarket coolers, huge improvement over a stock Intel fan cooler. Louder than the H50, a little bit more efficient than the H50, but if you spend a lot of time at wide open throttle, it, it might drive you nuts from the noise. Absolutely. Kyle, awesome information as always. We've got links to Hard OCP's full reviews of the H70 in the show notes. He's also got that serious comparison of NVIDIA SLI and ATI Crossfire X on the site. And there's a dog pile of motherboard reviews coming out this week. Kyle. Awesome stuff. Thanks so much for your time, man. Thank you, Patrick. Have a good one. Folks, coming up next, the Pan Digital Novel E-Reader. Is this the E-Reader that turns Veronica into the Hulk, as in smash, as in angry? You're going to find out, but first, we got to hear from one of our sponsors. Squarespace, it's a publishing system, it's hosting, it's an all-in-one place to put your website up, whether it's a blog, a portfolio, really any kind of website. They've got blog tools that allow you to update from your iPhone on the go. They make it easy to import sites from just about any place. Good, solid stats reporting and quite a bit more. Squarespace, they make it super Super easy for anybody to build out and maintain a site that you, well, probably have to pay big bucks for on other platforms. And if you have coding experience, perfect, because Squarespace lets you go under the hood, delve into the code, and customize things even further. Want to check out Squarespace? It's a great place to host a website. It's where mine's hosted. Go to squarespace.com. You can score a 14-day free trial, and be sure to use the promotional code TECHZILLA when you place your order. You get like two weeks free, then they want you to pony up your credit card. Use the code TECHZILLA when you do. You'll get 10% off your Squarespace order for the lifetime of your account. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, Facebook Headline News. These days, I barely even check my Google Reader for the newest stories to read. Eventually, all the good stuff bubbles up to the surface through my various social networks. Now, there's an easier way to see what your friends are sharing and what publications they're sharing from, at least on Facebook. It's called Facebook Headline News. When you go to the site, assuming you're logged into Facebook already, you'll see posts being shared from the major news sites, such as the BBC, the New York Times, and NPR. You can see which of your friends shared the link, and clicking on it will bring you to the source so you can read it. If none of your friends have shared any links from a certain publication, then Facebook Headline News will autofill it with popular articles being shared across the network. If the top news stories aren't interesting, you can dig deeper by selecting the categories at the top. This will show you more niche publications like Arts Journal or Treehugger, for example. The one thing I'd really like to see built into this product is a way for you to share the links on your own Facebook page, but right now you'll have to do it the old-fashioned way. Visit the news story itself and post a link onto your profile. So to see what news your friends are sharing on Facebook in one convenient place, visit Facebook Headline News today. And thanks to Christopher P. on Google Buzz for the tip. We love e-readers here at Sexilla, and when we got in a review unit for the Pan Digital Novel, I jumped at the chance to take it home and try it out. Mm -hmm. For those not in the know, the Pan Digital Novel is an Android-based e-book reader and multimedia device, and while it sounds great, in theory, in practice, it should have spent a little more time on the drawing board. Ouch. But yeah, let's talk about the good parts first. <laughs> it has a full color 600 by 800 resolution, 7 inch resistive touchscreen. And it's lighter and a little more comfortable to hold actually than the iPad, which mm. tends to be on the bigger side for e readers for me. Yeah. But it's about the same size as one of the new Kindles. Um, it has access to Barnes and Noble's extensive library of books, as well as full color magazines and newspapers. It's also really easy to set up. All I had to do was go into the settings and add 
add my Barnes & Noble account and then just find the Wi-Fi and password that I wanted to use. Are you pretty much locked into only Barnes & Noble selection? As far as I could tell, okay. yeah. Um, you know, I forgot to check if it does PDFs, so I'll mm -hmm. have to go back and take a look at that. But for the downloading purposes and for subscribing purposes, you are locked into Barnes & Noble. Okay. It comes with the big Barnes & Noble sticker right on the box <laughs> saying, use it with us. This are us. <laughs> yeah, one thing that I did find very interesting and we'll get, talk more about this later, is that it comes with a stylus. And at first, when I started using it, I did not know that there was a stylus, uh -huh. and I was trying to type in like my network settings and my password and stuff. 192.168. My thumbs, you know, like you would usually right. do. It was awful. We'll get more to that later, but the stylus is really the key to using this device, which is kind of weird when you think about it. That's very like 1999. Right? Yeah. I feel like I'm using my Tungsten T5 again, except I bigger. I was about to make <laughs> a palm reference. That was yeah. so bleeding edge. Back but then. with the stylus, you can pretty easily highlight and bookmark text in whatever you're reading and save it for later. Can you turn a page without using the stylus? You kind of can. More on that later as well. So sorry. <laughs> we'll get to the bads pretty soon, don't okay. worry. There's plenty. <laughs> uh, the battery life actually isn't terrible, uh, which is nice with the color screen. You would expect it to kind of suck battery life a little bit faster. It'll net you about seven hours of reading time, which is pretty good. So it's it's, it's like on a, par with, with the iPad if you're just doing some reading. So it's a tablet, not like a like not like an e-ink where you can read 72,000 novels. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's not going to last you 16 hours without a charge like the Kindle would of just straight reading. Mm -hmm. So that's that's on the downside, but it does have multimedia features like the ability to play videos, the ability oh. to view photos and play music while you're reading. So that's nice. It's a nice added benefit, but the fact of the matter is it doesn't do any of those things very well. <laughs> it does make pictures ugly. Yeah, so like adding all those things into one device is kind of like, well, I'd rather just use separate devices that do their jobs the way they're supposed <laughs> <laughs> um, it does have an SD card slot, which I enjoy. It does. It only has 128 megabytes of built-in memory, so it's nice to be able to have the card slot built sure. in, so you can add your own pictures or videos or, or music on there. And it's really cheap. It's under $200 on most of the sites that I found it on. It's available all over the place. That's super cheap compared to some of the pads we've seen, right. whether it's iPad or even some of the Android well, ones. Well, it's on the higher end for most of the ebook readers that are out right now, like mm -hmm. the Nook and the Kindle, which are you're gonna, gonna be 60, 50 bucks cheaper than this guy is. But for Android tablets, I guess it's on the you know, on par price wise. But the but the Kindle doesn't have the beautiful no well not so the, well the color screen. <laughs> <laughs> no, the Kindle does not yet have color e ink, but this is also not color e ink. Right. It's there, a six hundred by eight hundred resolution so color screen. So basically it's it's a tablet being branded as an e reader. Correct. Okay. Um now I should probably get to the bad stuff. It is appallingly slow. Like, mind-numbingly slow. The processor in this thing, it's got a 533 megahertz Samsung, like, ARM11 processor and, as I mentioned, 128 megabytes of built-in memory. And it just, it's sluggish. It's unbelievable. You press a button, it takes, you know, three or four seconds for it to move on to the next screen. And this is really bad when you're using it in its ebook reader function. Right. Because when you're trying to turn a page you with your fingers... You don't want to wait four seconds while the machine wakes up, no. looks around, goes, oh, a page needs to be turned. I mean, there's a time. <laughs> Tiny, tiny, minuscule delay on a Kindle. You know, just enough so that eventually your brain kind of compensates for sure. it and you push the button just a, a nanosecond before you're ready to turn the page. You know you're on the last sentence, you yeah, hit you, that Yeah, you button. hit it and you're good to go. This guy, it's like, it's pretty bad. That's I'll, bad. So that's yeah. actually worse than reading on like an iPhone or an Android phone. Oh no, the iPhone is way more responsive. That's, that's what I mean, yeah. like, like... I've never seen an ebook reader respond this slow before. It's that bad. That's it's bad. like I tried using it. And I'm like, really? This is an ebook reader? Anyway, um, the screen is terrible. The pictures are really washed out. Every picture I looked at from my own personal collection of cat photos did not, you know, it did not put the cats in their best light. It wasn't, just wasn't, <laughs> the wasn't a good bad. representation of my cats. Well, it's a very sort of like it. It looks like an an old. You know, it would have been like a top yeah. of the line 2090, you know what I mean? It's like a, it, it, it looks like a 1998 monitor. Well, even the sample video that they put on mm -hmm. here, which is supposed to showcase like the, the video quality, it looks like an animated GIF. It's washed out. Yeah, it it's looks chunky. like it just, with the fuzziness and with the almost, not I don't want to say pixelated because it's not pixelated, it's just got this graininess to it that is not good. I mean, compared to a screen like that, I mean, the e-ink screen is pretty crystal clear, and if you're used to using something like an iPhone or a book. with a retina display, <laughs> or a book for that matter, or the iPad, like you're, you're used to a certain amount of crispness, so mm -hmm. yeah, you're not going to get that on there. Um, and the orientation also doesn't really react very well. I was holding it in my hand, not moving it, and all of a sudden it decided to go horizontal 
on me. And I was like, mm. I wasn't doing that, but okay, I guess we'll look at you that way now. <laughs> um, and you can't double click on images or videos or anything to actually view them. You discovered this, which I found fascinating. I was like, click, click, click. No, click, you have to click, hit play click. from the little options thing to view them or view. It's uh, not very intuitive. Maybe double clicks are patented. Maybe. It's possible. <laughs> um, it doesn't feel that solidly made, uh, but that's probably helped keep the price down a little bit. Right. I mean, if you compare it to a Kindle or an iPad, it doesn't feel exactly as as solid. That and oomph. yeah, it doesn't. You feel like this could break pretty easily. It feels very plasticky. Um, so my final verdict: if you want a fantastic ebook reader, get something dedicated to the task, like the Nook or the Kindle, both of which are less expensive than this device, but will give you a better reading experience. If you want a tablet, pick up one of the new Arcos players that are also Android based <laughs> and are going to do a lot lot better job of letting you view your media and all your content than this guy. More bang for the buck, for sure. Or an iPad, which costs a lot more. You could do an iPad, too, but that's definitely going to be a few steps up in the, in the, <laughs> in price, the price range. range. Yeah. So that, that, that's, that sounds like a thumbs down. I would have to give the pan digital novel a resounding thumbs down. And I'm pretty surprised that it's being sold in as many places and being as, so pushed by so many retailers. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, gadget fans, I just can't envision them enjoying this. Maybe for people who want like, you know, baby's first tablet, baby's first <laughs> ebook reader, something that you can feel like your kids or, or your grandma can play with and not. Some products are marketed to the early adopters, some yeah. to the trailing adopters. I'm trying not to be snobby about it, but this is just not, not a very good device. The new Kindle? The new Kindle is awesome. It's worthy a great ebook reader. So basically, worthy successor. I would definitely say so. I mean, I have, I still have the Kindle 2, so I, this is Ryan's. I'm probably not going to upgrade until the next iteration because I'm right. still happy with my Kindle 2. But for first-time Kindle buyers, I mean, the price point is right. It's it's light and gorgeous. It's a great ebook reader. And is it faster than the previous ones? Um, I haven't noticed a market difference, um, but it, it does the job well. The screen looks it's just delicious. The screen is awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. And not as fatiguing as reading on an iPad. Coming up next. Viewer questions, ladies and gentlemen, but first, Ms. Belmont. We all know that most guys hate shopping for clothes. You gotta leave the house, go to the store, and look all over the place to find one or two things that are cool. Luckily, that error is over. Now, there's Jack Threads. Jack Threads is a members-only online shopping club that does the dirty work for you and saves you a boatload of cash. Each day, Jack Threads serves up the hottest new indie brands at a huge discount. We're talking up to 80% off what you'd pay in the store. And they've got amazing brands like Kid Robot, The Hundreds, and American Apparel for way less than you'd find anywhere else. Now, Jack Threads is a private club, but luckily, Texilla's got the hookup. To get access to these awesome deals, just go to jackthreads.com slash T-E-K, and you'll get to skip the wait list and become a member right away. Oh, and did we mention that it's free to join? Hit up jackthreads.com slash T-E-K, and you'll instantly start saving up to 80% without having to leave the house. Viewer questions. John writes in from Sunnyvale, California. Hi, Patrick and Veronica. I was wondering about refurbished or recertified hard drives. Hmm. Fry's has been advertising Western Digital 2 terabyte green drives off and on for under $100. I know that Patrick is a fan of refurbished products and was wondering, are these safe? Thanks, John in Sunnyvale. So I got to ask John, how much under $100? Because a brand new two terabyte Western Digital green drive sells for about $115 in local stores. A refurbished MyBook external drive is one thing, but you saw an actual two terabyte green drives for sale? Yeah, I mean, most, if you look at more often than not, a refurbished product will carry either the same warranty or a subset of the original warranty. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, if it's a subset of the original warranty, usually you get a price savings. I mean, I've bought, you know, Dell Atlas -like computers and monitors, been really happy with them. Some of them were refurbished. More often than not, they were like open box or somebody has like decided they didn't want it or, or it was a scratch and dent or something. Yeah, I, I figured you meant Western Digital's two terabyte MyBook drives. They've been showing up mm. online and in stores here under 100 bucks, which is a pretty good deal for like USB 2.0, eSATA, FireWire uh, 400 enclosures. So USB 3.0 is number one in my heart right now for drive uh, transfers. But I'd probably skip a refurbished internal drive or at least keep an eye on the warranty when you buy it and back up regularly. Because I just, the whole idea of a refurbished drive itself just makes me. Well, they can be okay, but I'm sure, it's, it, I'm it's sure an extra all layer of chance built into that. 
And there's just certain things I don't want to take a chance on. Seat belts, <laughs> never buy bargain seat belts, no. <laughs> never buy bargain airbags, and, and I'd, I'd probably add hard drives to that list. Okay. Yeah. All right, and then we have Alex in Virginia, and he's getting his DIY iPod repair on. Ooh. He says, hey, Texilla crew, I have an Ow. iPod Classic 160 gigabyte 6th gen that has stopped syncing. Mm. I have tried all of the methods possible, different computer, different cable, restoring, etc., and decided that the problem is a busted logic board. My question is, since an iPod iPod Classic 7th Gen logic board is only $5 more than a 6th Gen logic board. Could I use the 7th Gen board with all the parts for my 6th Gen iPod? Or should I just stick with the 6th Gen part and deal with the slower performance? Thanks for the help, Alex in Virginia. Yeah, where's I fix it when we need them? Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> I, was, I started looking at this like easy answer, right? And then you realize there's the 6th Gen, and then there was sort of a submodel of the 6th generation, which was the slim version, which is the 120 and 80 right. gigabyte hard drives. And some people are calling the 7th generation, this is sort of widescreen version that came out at the tail end of 2009. I gotta say, I think the performance boost you're seeing on the 120 gigabyte thin model iPod Classics is a hard drive thing and not the logic board. I could be horribly wrong. Because everything I'm seeing online for ordering boards basically says there's one logic board for all the iPod Classic models, which might be because there hasn't been much call for logic boards yet to repair all those last late model iPod Classics that came out at the tail end of 2009. But I would, I would I'd maybe try emailing iFixit or something or we could try that because I just don't see I just, I generally speaking, if it's a different board, it's not going to work in the older part. So no one logic board to rule them all, or yes? Well, it seems to be all, the, all of this, all of the six gen and the slim models all seem to use the the same logic board, but I can't get a, a legit answer on whether or not the tail end of two thousand nine seventh generation, mm. you know, which isn't in the Wikipedia entry, but is in a lot of people's references online about late model additions to the lineup. Yeah. Well, if you guys out there have a tip on this one, email us at texilla at revision3.com. And finally, Tom and from Buxton, Maine asks, I've noticed that you've been reviewing a lot of set-top boxes, and I was wondering if you could do a review or a contest between all of the popular boxes that are out. I'd like to buy a box, but there are just way too many. I'd like it to have a slew of codecs built in, but I can always just use handbrakes, so it's not a big deal. Could you guys and gals be amazing again and do something like that, please? <laughs> Tommy from Buxton, Maine. Well, I believe Mr. Norton owns or has pre-ordered all the major players in the set-top box scene, Roku, Pop Box, Apple TV Redux, uh, Boxy Box, with, which I think just went on pre-order this week from Amazon, by the way, uh, the WD TV, and of course, he's got the home theater PCs running Windows Media Center, or XMBC, or Boxy, or Plex, for and that matter. There are several more variations on that theme. This is kind of like the, the sort of legendary home theater PC roundup. In this case, like, because we can't forget the PS3, the X Xbox 360, I'm going to skip the Wii because it's standard def and I'm all about the HD. A roundup of all these shouldn't take more than about three hours, I think. <laughs> three figure. hours or so, I think we could do it. Because I'm not even getting into the whole fact that also a lot of the features you want, which is streaming and Netflix and Voodoo and Flickr and all sorts there of other no stuff. There is no one box that does everything but, everyone wants. But now the box is also in HDTVs and it's in Blu-ray yeah. players and it's in your iPad and it's in your iPhone. I think between Android you phone? and me and, and my home theater setup, we were just talking the other day about how we pretty much have every single one except Popcorn Hour. I don't think we, we have the that. popcorn. I know you C have it, but we don't have it at home. Um, I think between the two of us, we could probably wrangle everything together. So I But be, that might take a really long time. Yeah, because, I mean, f okay, so you look at it, it's like, you know, because there's like iTunes, that's one box. Okay, Netflix, there's 32,000 options. Yeah. You know, Voodoo, there's like 45 options. You know, does your player have to do XFID, H.264, MPEG-4, you know, MKV files, yeah. WMV files? How do we cross-test them? You know, what we need, we don't need a three-hour special. We need an Excel document. <laughs> <laughs> a very large Excel document with all the possible features that any one of those particular players could have and then just check them off. We've been trying to figure out how to parse all of the information going into that because for some people it's all about like I have 240,000 videos that I've downloaded and for other people it's like I want Netflix and a lot of times these two sets of desires don't yeah, it's, very I well. mean, it's all about what you need, right. what you want, how you want to consume your content. And that's different for everyone. Right. So you have to kind of find that box that's tailored for you. Because as we've said before, there's no one box to rule them all, and there probably won't be for a really long time. Yeah, and the box is now in, in your Blu-ray player and your new HD yeah. TVs, and probably, it's just weird. It's just the box is now in the TV. 
Yes. That just drives me insane. And there's like five different ways of doing that because Samsung's different from Sony, which is different from Vizio, which is different from, for all of you watching, we live in your questions. So email us, we are working on it. We're working on it. Textil at revision3.com is the email address. Email us about what you want to see in our legendary and probably impossible network detached storage roundup. Tech help, product reviews, how to's, you ask us, we'll do it, but we need those emails, so don't be shy. Send them into techzilla at revision3.com. Even better, send us in a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us a link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. Share your thoughts, ideas, or comments with other fans of the show. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Gordon. I'm Veronica Belmont. Till next time, you've been watching Texilla. John Lou Picard of the USS Enterprise in her continuing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilization, to boldly go where no one has gone before. My boobs! So, where can people suck their time and do... No, that's not gonna work. <laughs> that's not gonna work. Excuse me, Veronica Belmont! <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> oh, I just had time suck on the brain. <laughs> So where can people spend time on your properties? No, that was also hideous. Um, so where can people? It has a full color, 600 by 800 resolution, and a seven inch resistive touch screen, touch screen, three. And a seven inch resisted touch, resistive, I can't say that word. The full color, 600 by 800 resolution. Uh, <clears throat> this is the last time, I promise.